You know that feeling you get when you drop a $20 bill, but you don't know where? Now imagine if it was a $20 billion bill sitting on the ocean floor, patiently waiting to be discovered by anyone who could find it. For three centuries, the sunken wreckage of the San Jose has gone untouched, its mythology growing by the year. And in 1981, explorers achieved the dream of countless treasure hunters before them, discovering what has become known as the Holy Grail of shipwrecks. So why hasn't the largest treasure in humanity's existence been recovered? And to who does that treasure belong? Join us as we question everything about the fight for Colombia's Holy Grail. Back in 1708, the war for Spanish succession was well underway. To fund the war effort against the British, Spain had been traveling to its South American colonies, collecting gold, silver, and emeralds. The San Jose was part of a Spanish treasure fleet tasked with transporting that treasure back to Europe. The Spanish galleon San Jose was 150 feet long and carried 64 cannons, making it the largest in the fleet. Also on board, 600 souls and more treasure than all the other ships combined. Their last stop was in Cartagena before meeting with their escort in Havana for the journey back to Europe. Commander of the fleet, Jose Fernandez de Santelan, was warned of a British squadron that had been seen getting supplies on an island not far from Cartagena a couple months earlier. However, the escort was threatening to leave without them because of the approaching hurricane season, so he decided to push ahead. When they arrived just south of Cartagena, the fleet saw the British squadron approaching. Four warships commanded by Charles Wager. Wager knew of the treasure on board and instructed the squadron to capture the three Spanish galleons. Volleys of cannon fire were exchanged between the Spanish fleet and the British squadron. An attack ignited the San Jose's black powder, causing a sudden explosion. It sank within minutes, claiming nearly all of the 600 souls on board. As the rest of the fleet and its remaining treasure sailed away, all Wager and his men could do was watch as wealth beyond their wildest dreams slowly sank to the ocean floor just out of reach. In recent years, many entities have claimed ownership of the mythological treasure. Colombia argues that because the San Jose went down off the coast of Cartagena, the wreck lies in their territory, making it and the treasure theirs. Spain also claims ownership since it was a Spanish galleon that went down, therefore Spanish treasure being transported. And it seems they have a good argument. In 2000 and 2007, Spain successfully claimed ownership of two sunken treasures discovered in American waters by American explorers because they were Spanish ships transporting that treasure. Then there are some South American countries, namely Peru, that say, Whoa, hold on a minute there, Spainy. What do you mean your treasure? It may surprise you to learn that Spain in the 1700s didn't obtain their treasure by legal means. Remember when I mentioned the Spanish collecting gold, silver, and emeralds? Turns out they were collected from slave-operated mines. There is one more entity that claims ownership, but they didn't come along for almost three centuries. In 1979, ocean salvage company Glacamora requested permission to explore Colombia's coast. A year later, the Colombian government under President Ayala awarded them a license for a two-year operation. It gave Glacamora the rights to 50% of any treasure found, as stated in Article 701 of Colombia's Civil Code. The search began in 1980 with the use of side-scan sonar, which allowed the ship to map the ocean floor with impressive detail as it traveled along the surface. Over the next year, Glacamora upgraded their search efforts, first with an ROV that was controlled from the ship, then with the repurposed passenger submarine Auguste Picard. But all this searching and upgrading had taken a toll on Glacamora's wallet. So in November of 1981, they forged a partnership with a group of US-based investors called Sea Search Armada. Rejuvenated by this influx of capital, the crew dove back in, and a month later, the submarine picked up a major target. After investigating on further dives, the sub-crew could see wooden ship spars, square nails that had rusted out, and a cannon. And when they brought a sample of that wood up to the surface for testing, they found it was at least 300 years old. The crew now believed this was the fabled shipwreck of the San Jose. In February 1982, they reported their discoveries to Colombia and gave the approximate coordinates of the shipwreck. I say approximate because before GPS, the methods were less than exact. The map had to be made with sextants, an old sailor's tool that uses the angle between the Earth's horizon and things in space to determine coordinates. They generally have a margin of error between 1 and 3 miles, so not the most accurate map, but hey, it's better than having no idea where you dropped that $20 billion bill. The Colombian government acknowledged Glacamora's discovery, but in 1982, Belisario Betancourt was elected Colombia's new president, and with him came a few changes. Glacamora was given a 35% share instead of the original 50-50 split determined by Colombia's own civil code. 
Additionally, after investing over $6 million, Glockamora was out of money. So in 1983, they agreed to transfer all rights to Sea Search Armada, who in turn raised another $5 million and took over the project. That's when things took a hard turn. Betancourt's administration denied multiple requests to salvage artifacts and to return for a positive ID, making it impossible for SSA to verify the wreck. Columbia took it one step further in 1984 when they passed the seizure law, granting the government control and ownership over all assets recovered from shipwrecks in its waters. What a coincidence. It's almost as if they passed the law specifically because of the San Jose. The seizure law eliminated all of SSA's property rights, leaving them with a 5% finder's fee of what Columbia says it's worth, which would then be taxed at 45%. What a bag of dicks that government was. Obviously, this prompted SSA to launch a legal battle, but they had no idea how long they'd be fighting. In 1989, they appealed the seizure law in Colombian courts, saying it was retroactive and unconstitutional. The courts agreed, not only finding the law unconstitutional, but ruling for the 50-50 split that Glockamora was originally promised. This was a huge win for SSA and its investors, but the Colombian government, now under President Samper, lied and said that SSA had lost its rights to the treasure. In 2007, Colombia's Supreme Court upheld the decision about the seizure law, but the government under President Uribe continued the false narrative. It seemed like no matter what its courts ruled, even its own Supreme Court, Colombia was not going to listen, and SSA was getting more desperate. In 2010, after having multiple letters ignored by President Santos's administration, SSA drafted a letter in Spanish saying that if Colombia wouldn't agree to the terms, SSA was going to recover its findings with or without their blessings. Colombia's response was simple. Considering that this concerns the defense of Colombian territory, the National Armed Forces will prevent the realization of unauthorized activities. Unsurprisingly, SSA lost all its salvage contractors and any money invested in salvage preparations because no one wanted to be attacked by the Colombian Navy. Following these threats, SSA went back to court, this time suing Colombia in the District of Colombia. No relation. Colombia basically said screw you and just filed a motion to dismiss. The court agreed, arguing they can only rule on an amount of money, and the contract did not grant SSA a percentage of any figure. It granted them the right to claim 50%. And to add insult to injury, the statute of limitations had passed the three-year deadline, only five months prior to the suit being filed in late 2010. A heartbreaking technicality. Could things get any worse for Sea Search Armada? As years passed, people grew more skeptical that the San Jose was ever really found. Many called on the government to abandon further exploration, believing the shipwreck should be protected. And respectfully, Colombia said, Fuck that! Because on December 5th, 2015, President Santos went on TV to announce that about a week earlier, and with the help of international researchers, Colombia had found the San Jose. And because we know they love discrediting SSA, he also announced that the wreck was in a different location than the coordinates they provided. But remember, that was before GPS, so SSA's map had up to a 3-mile margin of error. That's an area of over 28 square miles. SSA claims that Columbia used their coordinates as a starting point to rediscover the wreck in order to erase SSA and Glockamora from the history of the San Jose. But President Santos had a perfect defense. A white-bearded foreigner came up to him at an embassy reception and said he'd created a map based on previously unknown information, including wind patterns. Totally believable. The big question is, after seeing what happened with SSA, who would be stupid enough to sign a contract with Columbia? Well, that would be Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And this was not their first rodeo, most notably discovering the remains of the Titanic in 1985. So in early 2015, WHOI partnered with the Colombian government because it didn't care about the treasure. It's a non-profit, which is honestly what Columbia should have been looking for in the first place if they didn't want to part with any of the wreck. A few months later, the search began using the AUV, or Autonomous Underwater Vehicle, the Remus 6000. This allowed them to program where they wanted the AUV to go and let the robot do about 20 hours of unmanned exploration. In November, after scanning about 80 square miles, the side scan sonar spotted a promising target. The next day, they revisited the site to take high-definition pictures, and when a marine archaeologist took a look, he saw the distinctive engravings of dolphins on bronze cannons. After 308 years, the San Jose had been positively identified. After the discovery, the UN started to get involved, sending a letter urging Colombia not to exploit the booty for commercial gain. 
However, the fate of the San Jose was left up in the air when Colombia refused to sign the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. It would subject them to international standards and require them to inform UNESCO of any plans for the wreck. Then in 2022, President Petro was elected and he made recovery of the San Jose a priority, instructing the Minister of Culture to pick up the pace. The goal is that the wreckage be unearthed by the end of his first term in 2026. What a way to get reelected. And just last December, the government announced it will try to raise objects from the San Jose. They say the plan is to build an archaeological lab where every piece can be cleaned and studied, then displayed in a national museum. No progress has been announced as of this video's release. Now that you're all experts on the subject, let's return to the original question. To who does this treasure truly belong? Is it the group who found it? See Search Armada? Yeah, I said it, Columbia. Many involved lost their fortunes and some lost their lives before seeing any resolution, all while having their biggest discovery discredited. However, as much as they'd like it to be, this was never their treasure. But Jesus Christ, Columbia, at least compensate them for their money and effort. And is it Columbia? They say it's theirs based on location and claim to have found it. They also say SSA are a bunch of doodle heads, because that's where it seems their maturity level is. Is it Spain with the argument, my ship, my treasure? Although, if I found your wallet 300 years after you died, is it still really your wallet? Or is it a country like Peru that claims the treasure wouldn't have been on those ships if Spanish colonizers hadn't enslaved their ancestors? Some argue that the San Jose belongs right where it is. Nautical archaeologist Ricardo Barrero argues the shipwreck lies there because it has reached equilibrium with the environment and there is no better way for it to be resting. Now, I don't know about all that Mother Earth equilibrium stuff, but I do understand the argument that it shouldn't belong to anyone. When there's a lot of money around, people are bound to fight over it, but sometimes it's just not about the money. In 1708, hundreds of men fought and died for this unimaginable wealth, and 300 years later, not much has changed. A treasure mined by slaves, hundreds of seamen who died defending it, a king who destroyed it instead of capturing it, investors who lost their fortunes finding it, a country fighting for 50 years to keep it for themselves. The San Jose, holy grail of shipwrecks, truly holds real-life cursed treasure. Who do you think has the right to the San Jose and its treasure? Let me know in the comments. If you want another video on some weird stuff, check these out. And don't forget to like and subscribe, it really helps the channel. Thanks for watching everyone, I will see you next time.